Today, my featured guest is David Murrow. He is director of Church for Men, an organization dedicated to restoring a healthy, life-giving, masculine spirit in Christian congregations. BC Nation, we need more masculinity, not the fake toxic masculinity that is being pushed right now, but real men standing up and leading their homes, leading their wives, leading their kids. So David is the author of Why Men Hate Going to Church, an inspirational bestseller with more than 150,000 copies in print in more than a dozen languages. Now, David's day job is television producer and writer. And you'll see he's got the radio voice to back up that, that whole uh, bunch of experience he's got. He's drawn on his four decades of experience in the screen entertainment business for his latest book. We're going to speak about it today. Drowning in Screen Time. In that book, David uses five simple, memorable parables to explain how screens hijack our attention, inflame our emotions, and alter our perception of reality. And if you don't think that's happening to you, you are missing the boat. David's going to bring it with some proof. Now, David is father and husband of 36 years and lives in Anchorage, Alaska. So, David, welcome to Broken Catholic, number one podcast on iTunes for Protestants and Catholics. Uh, thank you for being here, and go ahead and fill in some of the gaps in that intro, would you? Yeah, well, uh, Joseph, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. I'll try not to radio voice you too much, but uh, I have worked in the screen business for almost 40 years, uh, married for 36 years to my wife, Gina, and we have three kids and seven grandkids. So, uh, uh, my journey into this latest book came when I came to realize that I was myself a screen addict. Uh, my addiction came calling in the form of Wi-Fi. I, in the early 2000s, I got my uh, MacBook Pro out and I got Wi-Fi and I could connect wirelessly. And I would just sit in my chair and I would ignore my kids. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of men who tell similar stories. They get lost in video gaming. They get lost in online pornography. You know, there's so many ways that our screens bring us toxic content. And so I really felt called to speak into that space, especially since I work in the media and I know the tricks that guys like I use, uh, like me, use to uh, keep you swiping and keep you outraged and keep you coming back to our sites and, and watching our programs. Mm. Screen addict, not a term uh, we readily hear. Nobody wants to be addicted to anything, right? It comes with a connotation of weakness of mm -hmm. uh, you're not in control. And we all love to be in control. Let's be honest. We're all little control freaks, right? At the end yeah, of the day. Especially men, yeah. Especially men, right? So, you know, I always look at screen time as just a form of escapism, right? Mm -hmm. What am I escaping from right now in my life that I don't want to address, that I don't want to take head on? Uh, is it the same when, with all the men that you work with, do you find it's the same thing, whether they admit it or not? Or is it something else? That's a great question. Uh, you know, in my position with Church for Men, I'm able to speak with guys all the time. And it was amazing to me how often uh, those men who have stumbled or fallen, their descent into madness began with a screen habit, whether that was, uh, you know, ex just excessive television viewing, maybe a few generations ago. Uh, or then you have guys who get lost in online pornography or video gaming or it just becomes their, their escape and they escape too much. You know, there's nothing wrong with taking a brief respite from the world, you know, hey, let's relax, let's watch a movie for a couple of hours. You know, no problem with that. Uh, what I'm talking about is a lot of guys and gals now too, are completely substituting real life for screen life. And that's taking a huge toll in our relationships and our society. Uh, it's sidelining warriors who could be out doing great things. Uh, instead, they're blasting simulated aliens on the screen with a controller in their hand while they munch Doritos. It's this complete uh, displacement of real life that's uh, causing the big problems. So, you know, when you think about or speak about video games, for example, I know a lot of guys that they're grown men. They're in their 40s. They're in their 50s. They're successful in business. Yet they're there playing video games like they're 16. And this is my hypothesis and correct me if I'm wrong, you're the expert, not me, but it's like the, the screens and the video games, they have some kind of control. They can control what's happening. 
they could win. They could be champion. They could be victorious. They could get to the next stage, the next level of the game. But in life, it's not as easy for them to do that. And maybe they're winning in the game on the screen, but in life they're losing. What, what shows up for you in that? Is that a, a correct hypothesis there? It's a that, lack of that, control in your own life that you're, you're searching for on the screen. No, you really put your finger on it. As you mentioned in the intro, there's five parables that the book is based on. The fifth parable is the story of King David who went from being a humble shepherd boy with absolutely no control over what happened to him to the king of Israel, where he has complete control over everything. And that control ruined him. That destroyed him. If you read the last third of David's life, it's a complete train wreck. He did not know what to do with the power he was given. In the screen world, we exercise king-like, almost godlike control. We control what messages we see, we control what we eat with a swipe on the phone, where we go, what we see, what opinions we'll tolerate. And common people have never had that level of control till 10 or 15 years ago. So that if you don't know how to, con- how to manage that level of power over your personal life and over your relationships, you will eventually use it to destroy yourself. You will cut yourself off from people. You know, David cut himself off from his brothers and his father. He controlled who came into his royal presence. And we do that too in the digital world. So one of the reasons we love the digital world is we can, if, if something goes bad, it's game over. We start over. We can do a clean slate. You can't do that in real life. And so once we immerse ourselves hour after hour, day after day in the digital world, then we go to the real world and almost nothing bends to our will. And that's, you know, we see this cancel culture going on. We call these young adults snowflakes because they're so hypersensitive. All they're doing is taking what they learned in the digital world and trying to apply that level of control to the real world. You know, hey, I see an opinion I don't like, delete, right? And so it's having very dangerous consequences for basic rights, such as uh, the right to free speech, the freedom of religion, some of these basic constitutional rights, because uh, people have been taught to exercise control and they don't know how to manage it in the real world. Mm. So I think that gives a very good uh, synopsis of one side of what's going on, one side of the table, which is the user of the screen. Let's go to the other side, the flip side, right? Because you have experience in this. You have expertise. You even said it in your intro. Hey, I know how to put out content that's going to manipulate. You didn't use this word. I am. But that is going to manipulate uh, the reaction of the viewer. Speak to us about that. What's going on you know, with the puppet masters out there of digital content that have us all feeding or the yanking on our strings, our emotions, our feelings, playing on our fears? Tell us more about that. Yeah, I like that word fears. Uh, another one of the parables I talked about in my book was about David and the shepherd when he was a, a young boy. And you know, David sits there day after day and nothing much happens. And then all of a sudden a wolf attacks one of the lambs. And I talk about the biochemical reactions that take place when something bad happens, when something unusual happens, and how our bodies respond in fight or flight mode. Now, those, those chemicals are meant to flow once every couple of days or maybe once a week, because that's the monotonous world that we developed in as humans over thousands of years. Well, what's happened with screens and screen content is the producers of screen content have learned how to produce the wolf Anytime we want him, we can produce this novelty. We can produce this feeling of panic in people's uh, hearts that causes them to, oh my gosh, I've got to, oh, I've got to read this article. I've got to, uh, it, it, what, the way I describe it is we trot the wolf out 24 seven. And again, our bodies, our minds are not designed to be hyper stimulated all the time. And this is why we're seeing this panic especially for people who have very suspicious personalities and who have highly developed either right-wing or left-wing views, they can find online content that is constantly stimulating their sense of fear and that keeps them attached to their screens. And that's just one way that we, you know, the producers of screen content do that is through that panic. Not everybody is that suspicious. Not everybody's motivated that way. So we have emotional tricks that we can do. 
Uh, we can, you know, romantic movies, for example, the Hallmark Channel, if you will, <laughs> they know exactly how to keep women watching that channel. They know how to tell those stories because there's a lot of lonely women out there who fantasize about being loved by a man. And so there's just any number of ways that those of us who produce screen content use your emotions to keep you involved and locked into the screen and locked out of real life. Mm, very powerful. So I like the way that you distinguish between there's content producers. Most of them are good. They don't have an evil agenda, but there is a percentage that do, right? Especially maybe in the political arena to really push one side and to get everybody to follow, to, to walk in a certain direction that really plays to what they're going for, their, their motives, et cetera. What's the cost of constantly being plugged into uh, a screen that is over and over and over and over again throughout the day, stimulating that fear button in us, that panic, that fight or flight. What's the cost to us? So that my listener right now says, David, yeah, I get what you're saying, but dude, I'm not going to stop. Like, are you kidding? Like, you got, this is part of the real world. I got to be on my screen. I got to do business. I got to look at social media. I got to stay up with current events. Sure. Maybe my button's being pushed a little, but seriously, what's the big deal? Well, let's start with the scriptures. I mean, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a sound mind. And so when our fear button is being constantly pushed in order to keep us locked to a screen, we're not seeing the people around us. We're not seeing the good things that are happening around us. All we're seeing is this disaster that's being presented to us. Wolves, wolves, wolves over and over again. That's not healthy. It's not natural. It's not normal. It's not how we're made to be. Um, the other thing, if we watch the average uh, pre-pandemic Nielsen Media Research, which is the gold standard of, of uh, research, did a study in 2018 and found that the average North American spends nine hours a day uh, on screens. Uh, that's not counting the amount of time we spend for school and work. We are using almost every leisure moment we have on our screens. And you see this, you know, if, if people are in the airport, they're not looking at each other. They're not praying to God. They're not smiling at a friend. They're on their screens. And so what's happening is all that screen time is displacing uh, the, the time that we used to devote to prayer, to meditation, to just relaxing our brains. And that's taking a toll. Uh, a lot of people, you know, there, there's been this uh, huge outbreak of depression, anxiety, especially among young adults. And it broke out about the time smartphones became commonplace. A lot of people want to blame the content, and that's part of the equation. But I think a more basic explanation is just the fact that our brains never rest. Our brains are not designed to be stimulated 24-7 uh, or you know, at least 16 hours a day, whatever we're awake. So that's the toll that this constant scrolling and constant watching is taking on us. We're just we're simply not designed to know about the news all over the world. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'll give you one more point, then I'll I'll turn the mic back over. But if you think about it, if in the day, times of King David, if there was a typhoon in the Philippines, did he know about it? No. If a volcano went off in Indonesia and killed a million people, he didn't know about that. Only thing he knew about was what happened right around his hometown in Israel, right? His, our brains, our, our, our psyche, our, our, uh, we are designed to know about the people around us. We are not designed to know about every crisis that affects everyone everywhere. And so we're beginning to see compassion fatigue because it seems like there's always a hurricane, there's always a fire, there's always some, and then the media will uh, uh, amplify these things. You know, I get on the Washington Post and it's, it's national news when some uh, white person says something nasty to a black person. That's, you know, I mean, goodness, really? This is national news now that somebody said something, uh, used a, a bad word? Uh, we, just, we just are not designed to be panicked and, and provoked this way so much. Mm. This is powerful what, where you're taking this conversation, I believe, because that's, that's a great point of view is that before devices, before internet, we were very focused on who was in front of us, what was on front, in front of us, what we could do about it, how could we connect with that person, etc. We didn't have the responsibility or the weight of the world coming through our eyes. Right, because that is a form of playing God, isn't it? Yeah, I think we, in some ways, Christians especially, usurp the role of God. We read things online. 
about uh, unrighteous things that are happening in the world. And I think we take those things onto our shoulders instead of taking them to the Lord in prayer, to the one who can really affect the situation. Um, you know, it's not really my responsibility if there's some court ruling that doesn't go my way. What can I do about it? All I can do is pray and trust that God has a situation in hand. So yes, I agree with you. I think all this responsibility that the internet puts on us, we're supposed to care about everything. And you know, our, our, our ability to care should be devoted to those things that we can do something about and the people that are given to us to love and care for. BC Nation, what I'm hearing David Murrow say here is that these devices are making us care about everything. And when you care about everything over a long period of time, you start to care about nothing or no yes. one. When you care yeah. about everyone, you start to care about no one. You become desensitized to the very people in your life that you're meant to love and care about and be responsible for. That's what it's costing you. David, piggyback on that. Yes, I think every Christian is given a mission. Uh, not Maybe not a specific mission, but an, a mission field, an area that they're supposed to... Uh, that they're supposed to be working in, a field to plow, as it were. And I think their screens are distracting us from those missions by giving us so much content, so much information, and so much distraction. I mean, it's, it's much easier to put on a movie for a couple hours than it is to call your aunt, who would appreciate a little bit of encouragement. So many times we, uh, we can hide from our mission by using our screens. And I think that's a loss to the church and a loss to society. Hmm. Very powerful. Okay, so I'm going to ask you, I think you, you tapped our hearts there. First, first you knocked on our heads. Uh, you hit us with some logic, but you started to really tap to the heart. It's costing us our relationships. And let's be honest, BC Nation, and I'm with you in this. You know, all the statistics show that deathbed confessions, when people are on their deathbed, the number one that thing that they have regrets about in their life is what? It's not their money. It's not the possessions. It's not what news they missed on their, their smartphone. It's not what they accumulated. It's one thing. Number one regret, their relationships, their relationships. And it's three relationships. It's your relationship with God, first and foremost, your relationship with others, and your relationship with yourself. And being on your devices too long, David is telling you, it's costing you all three of those areas, which means you, my friend, listening to this show right now, are on track to be a statistic, a deathbed regret statistic, unless you make a sharp turn. David, top three tips or strategies that you have for my listener who just got that aha moment and said, I want to turn. I don't want to be a statistic on my deathbed with regrets. What do they do? Well, uh, let's build on that relationships that you were talking about. Um, first of all, you've got to realize that uh, your social media network is an illusion. Most of the people that you talk to on social media, you will never see in person again. And that's been one of the, the unintended negative consequences of social media. I have lots of friends on social media that I knew in high school, that I knew in college. They might have been past business associates. And I chat with them and it's fun. It's fun keeping up with old friends. But what it's doing is it's keeping me from developing new friendships or developing friendships with the people around me. Because it's much, I can hold that person in social media at arm's length. If that person posts something political that I don't like, I can quietly unfriend them. It's that control issue again. So what I would say is tip number one to your listeners is if you don't want to die alone and lonely, you need to be developing real flesh and blood relationships. And I know that's hard to do in a time of pandemic when you can only see people from the eyes down, <laughs> but um, you've really got to work on tend constantly tending those relationships with people that you are going to see now and in the future. And don't give all your energy to those old friends on Facebook or on Instagram because those are not real relationships and those folks will not be there for you when you age and you can't be there for them because they, they're, they're far flung. Second tip that I would give is if you are looking to cut back on your screen time, the single simplest, <clears throat> excuse me, the single simplest thing that you can do is focus on eliminating mindless screen time. So look at your habits. 
when you come into your house or your apartment at the end of a day, are you the type that just mindlessly clicks on the television? millions of people still do that. Did you know TV is still the number one screen activity we do? More than smartphones, more than computers. It's still just watching dumb old TV. That's what we do. So if you're the type who just kind of clicks on the TV and has the TV noise in the house, I want to challenge you not to do that. If you're the type who we do sit down uh, or you're standing in line at the bank or in the grocery store, or you're just waiting for your baggage at the baggage carousel at the airport and you mindlessly whip out your phone, my challenge to you is don't do that. Uh, train yourself to look around, to be aware of your surroundings. As a believer in Jesus, you have an opportunity to pray for the people around you. Hey, there's a woman who's, who's obviously struggling. I'm gonna pray for her. Maybe I'm gonna ask her if she needs help. Uh, you, you, you need to be aware of the opportunities that God places in your universe and uh, eliminate that mindless screen time and open your eyes to what God is doing all around you. Mm, powerful, 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 and very, very simple, BC Nation. I also would just add to that, if you're waiting in line or you're at the airport, maybe you do pull out your smartphone because somehow it's crazy glued to your hand, right? They just don't <laughs> separate ever. You sleep with the thing, you use the restroom with the thing. I don't know. Well, then use it for good. Rather than dulling your mind, make a phone call to mm. someone who you haven't spoken to in a while and do a simple, spend that 10 minutes that you're waiting for your flight to call up your best buddy or to call up your aunt or your, your mom or your dad somewhere else and to say, hey, I was just calling to touch base with you. I have 10 minutes before I jump on the plane. I just want to hear about your life. How are you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, or... Yeah, or there's an, there's an even simpler way. I'm, I'm going to sound like a hypocrite here, but take that phone, send five texts to people you love and send them a heart emoji. Hey, how are you doing? I mean, it's very simple. You know, the same technologies that enslave us can ultimately free us if they're used properly. And so, you know, I'm not anti-screen. I'm not anti-phone. What I am is anti-obsession. And, uh, you know, phones are a wonderful, powerful tool that we are using to access and we're paying the price. So yeah, use that phone that's glued to your hand and do something for, for your friends, for your loved ones, and for Christ. BC Nation, remember at the end of your life, you are going to look up to Jesus and he's going to judge you on your relationships. Did you love me first and foremost? That's what he's going to ask, right? Number one command. Did you love others, the people I put around you, those relationships? Those are the two great commands. And they're the two things that you're paying the biggest price for right now with your, your screen time. Isn't that interesting? So, David, um, we're about to get into my favorite part of the show. Uh, welcome to the confession round. But before we do, uh, we're speaking with David Murrow. He's the author of Why Men Hate Going to Church. Uh, and his new book, Drowning in Screen Time. That's what we devoted this conversation to. You can find him and his books at davidmurrow.com, davidmurrow.com. Uh, David, welcome to the confession round. I'm going to ask you 10 quick fire questions. You'll have about three seconds to answer each. Don't overthink it. It's just for fun. Are you ready, sir? Okay, let's go. What's your favorite thing about God? Uh, his love for me. What's your least favorite thing about God? His love for me. Meaning? <laughs> um, how I don't deserve it. Got it. What are you most afraid of? Uh, actually, declining health as I age. I don't like needles. <laughs> I get that. Uh, I believe we're all struggling with something at any given moment of our life. It's just part of the human condition. What are you currently struggling with right now, either professionally or personally? Uh, I wish I was closer with all my kids and grandkids. Mm. Yeah, I get that. What did you spend way too much time doing this past year? Oh, gosh. Uh, spinning my wheels on re-edits with my book. How's that one? <laughs> <laughs> re-edits. They're endless. They're endless. Yeah, I agree. Uh, what secret fear do you have about people? that they won't like me. Yeah, got it. That's a very human emotion right there. Mm -hmm. What do you wish you had learned sooner about God? 
uh, how, uh, how I'm sound like a broken record, how unconditional his love for me is. It doesn't rely on my doing. Yeah, I got it. Performance-based mm-hmm. religion, yeah, right? Precisely. Yep. What is a new habit that you want to create in your life? Uh, want to, yeah, I want to, uh, exercise more regularly. Yeah, I got it. And that will impact the whole health, uh, fear. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, what's a bad habit that you want to break? Uh, believe it or not, screen time. I want to, I want to winnow even more screen time out of my life. What's been the number one strategy you've used to really win in your screen, uh, screen time battle? Uh, just the research that I've done and the, and just the awareness of what the screens are doing to me. And that's really helped you like be aware yeah. and, and cut it down and be like, what am I doing? Let if me, I can take I more, can I take more than three seconds on this one? Cause Go ahead. I think this will be good. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I wrote, my, I've read a lot of books, obviously in this genre before I wrote my own. And a lot of them are written by social scientists and psychologists. And so they take a very academic approach. just a lot of scary statistics and stuff like that. Uh, the reason I started with parables is because I wanted people to understand from a from a story perspective mm-hmm. what the screens are doing to you uh, and get mad about it. Uh, I don't think people, people, alcoholics don't give up alcohol until they realize what alcohol is doing to them. Um, I can give you, I can give an alcoholic 20 tips on how to stop drinking, but until he gets mad enough to want to change, until he reaches <laughs> hits bottom, so my book is really a hit bottom book. It's look, I'm not going to give you a big long to-do list of how to solve this. What I'm going to do is help you understand what's actually happening. And that's my goal. And that's what the book did for me. It's what it did for my wife. She read my manuscript and boom, her screen time, you know, her watch tells her how much screen time she does during the week. Boom, she's down 40% right away because it gave her the will to give it up. She saw what she was missing. And so that's the prayer. That's my hope for my book is that people will see this, understand what's going on, and then want to find help. Perfect. Awesome. Pick three words to describe who you are now. Mm. I'm a dad. I'm a husband. And I'm a learner. Got it. Pick three words to describe who you are before you experience God in your life in a real relationship with him. Oh, good. <laughs> I was angry, angry young man, if that could be one word. Uh, I was uh, lost mm. and I was vengeful. Vengeful. Got it. Unforg- unforgiving would be a better word. Unforgiving. Yeah. yeah, it's an ugly word, but it's very real, isn't it? Yeah, I was unforgiving. Take three minutes. Uh, I'm just going to go at, off script here a little bit with the questions um, because we, we skipped over your personal journey, but at what point, what was the, the rock bottom moment for you um, where you really gave over your life uh, to Christ? Paint well, us a, a, a quick picture. Yeah, no, it, I was a 15-year-old kid and unforgiveness was at the center of my family. My family of origin kept score of everything and they were very good at holding grudges. My dad could not stay in a relationship with another person or another couple for more than a year, there'd be a break and then you go find another friend. And so that was my family heritage. My mom, my grandma would tell me stories of people who had wronged her 50 years before. She had never Mm -hmm. let it go. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when I was about 15, I started to get crossways with people, Uh, my friends in school, you know, it's high school drama, junior high school drama and stuff. But I didn't want that. At the same time, I, I had met these two dynamic Christian men. I had started going to their Bible study. And the topic that night was forgiveness. And I thought, that's the thing that's missing in my life. That's what's missing in my family. That's what I can't seem to generate myself. And so uh, that night I went home, prayed, and gave my life to Christ. And of course, the first thing I had to do is call someone up who had wronged me and forgive them. And it was, and all these gracious words start coming out of my mouth, words I had never, I didn't even know some of these words. And that was the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through me for the first time. I, I was changed from that moment forward. And, you know, I'd like to say that I've, over the years, I wish I had changed more, but God is continuing to make me better and better in the area of forgiveness and being loving and, you know, letting these things go. And that's made me a better person. David, I'm very, very happy I asked that question. In what I do with family transformation coaching, I help 
very successful high achievers heal broken family relationships. And the number one thing we do is have those forgiveness conversations hmm, because we hold, we hold on to that bitterness, that resentment, and it keeps us from healing and, and really God healing and restoring those, those wounds in those relationships. And I truly believe that when we get to heaven, God's going to have an account of like all the broken relationships that you never mended. I never yeah. mended. And yeah. I want, I want that list to be blank page. Wow. You, you handled them all. Okay. Well done. Yeah. So thank well, Yeah. Go ahead. Well, one of my counselors once said, if you don't forgive someone, it's like giving them free rent inside your head. For sure. So, so <laughs> it's been key to my restoration and my growth as a man. And I'm really glad to hear that you're doing that work with uh, the executives too, because uh, you know, I've worked for some pretty high powered people over my years. I used to work at the governor's office, used to work for Sarah Palin here in Alaska. And, uh, you know, a lot of these government types, these high achievers, high flyers, you know, you can tell they're just bound up in unforgiveness and fear. And so the work you're doing is very valuable. Thank you very much. Last question. If you could come back to life after you died, look your family and friends, your wife, your kids in the eye and give them only one piece of advice about everything, life, eternity, relationships, screen time, all of it. What would you say to them? I think... I think to my grandsons, for example, I would want them to know that that uh, following God is an adventure and not just an obligation. Uh, it's life's truest adventure. Yeah, I have I have six grandsons and one granddaughter, and uh, you know I know how boys are wired, and I've read Wild at Heart, and <laughs> all, you know there's a lot of really, uh, but boys reach that age. They're getting to that age where they think church is boring and dull and. And they need to understand the adventure, the real, the true adventure of following Jesus is that, that battle for your heart. And uh, I would want them to know that they should, they should give their hearts over to Jesus at a young age and begin living that adventure rather than wandering uh, pointlessly through the wilderness of our experiences. Well said. Any final wisdom? What's the one thing you want my listener to know about having a relationship with God versus not? Well, just, you know, dive into the, I would say dive into the gospel of John. If you want to explore the Christian faith, start with John chapter one. It's a little bit confusing right away, but you'll get into a quick, pretty good narrative real quick by, by chapter two, Jesus is turning over tables. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, but yeah, just get into the Bible and read it for yourself. That was part of my redemption is uh, just, I, I was, I had the measles. I was about, uh, 14 years old and there was a living Bible sitting there and there was no VCRs back then. There was no tapes. There was nothing for me to do all day. So I picked up this living Bible and started reading the gospel of John and was so amazed by what I saw there. It was completely different than what I thought was there. So if you uh, don't, if you're not currently following Jesus and you want to know more about that, uh, forget what everything you've learned and just pick up the Bible and read it for yourself and take take that challenge and just see if it doesn't change your perception of what a Christian is and what life is really about. You know, this generation, we struggle with screen time. In our previous generation, we spent most of our time on paper time, right? We actually read books, mm -hmm. right? To your point. So that's a simple uh, answer for a lot of us. What's the best way for BC Nation to get in touch with you to pick up your book? How do they find you? Uh, I, I am at churchformen.com. I'm also building a site at davidmurrow.com. There's still quite a few things that need to be built, but you can contact me through there. A real quick plug. Uh, I am speaking free. I'm waiving all speaking fees in 2021. So if your church or group wants to bring me in, I'll come in for expenses, or you can bring me in free via Zoom. I just want to get the word out. It's my gift to the church in 2021. I want to get the word out about screen time. So please contact me through davidmurrow.com. And we'll arrange a time for me to speak to your group, either live or via Zoom. That is quite the generous offer. I saw that on your website and I kind of was taken aback. And I was like, what? Free speaking for the entire year? That's quite a big commitment, brother. Especially if a well, lot of people take you up on it. Well, you know, I'll do the best. I, I, I've got to qualify that. If, if, if you have a Sunday school class of eight people, I'm probably not going to come, uh, you know, but I've got, I have to be wise about my time. I'm trying to reach as many people as possible. But if you if you have a group of any size or influence, I definitely want to be there, especially if you're at a university setting, a seminary, please bring me in. I really am interested in impacting 
uh, the upcoming uh, generation of leaders in the church. And, you know, let's get these conversations started because, uh, you know, what we fix our eyes upon is our is the object of our worship. And right now, our eyes are fixed upon our phones. Instead of upon eyes, God. We need to get those eyes fixed upon Jesus again. Amen to that. David Merrow, thank you for being on Broken Catholic. I wish you God's love, peace, and joy in your life, sir. Bless you, Joseph. Thank you.